So thank you all for joining uh, this session. It's session number 4AN, that's Apple Neutral. Um, ZOS Connect e monitoring and tuning. Um, this session is being recorded. You see on your screen at the moment a QR code. That's for the feedback, the session feedback. So please, can you make a note of that or take a photo or scan it? Um, because your feedback is important to us. The, um, the, the session is being conducted today by Mark Hiscock from the Hursley Labs down in, um, in Hursley. We've also got Alan Hollingshead, uh, who will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, please just um, put your, your question in the chat and either Alan will address it or I'll just, I'll, I'll just be rude and interrupt Mark and ask him the question for his view. So with that, um, I'll hand over to Mark and he will tell you all about ZOS Connect monitoring and tuning. Thank you, Mark. Excellent, thanks, Nick. And hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this second session today on ZOS Connect. Um, thanks to Tony for his session this morning where he covered <clears throat> the future of APIs on Z. And if you weren't in that session, I encourage you to go uh, watch a recording later of it. Um, but in this session, we're going to kind of bring the focus back a bit uh, on today and the ZOS Connect E version 3 product, uh, looking specifically at monitoring and performance tuning. So a brief introduction of me. Um, as Nick said, uh, my name is Mark Hiscock and I work in the Hursley lab, uh, specifically in the ZOS Connect development team. And I spend my time uh, developing the product, but also uh, supporting a lot of our customers in the field. And so this presentation has really brought together a lot of useful information that we've uh, discovered in the development team, the performance team, and the support team, um, but also information that we've gathered with our experience dealing with um, customers and helping them through their performance monitoring and tuning. And what I've done is I've brought it all together, distilled it down into this kind of presentation uh, to give to you today. Um, but first, I want to say a big thanks to Alan, as Nick mentioned, he's on the chat uh, looking for the questions um, for his help in bringing this content together. Um, and also the lab services team from Montpellier, whose help has also been uh, very invaluable in, in bringing this content um, and producing this deck. And if you do find it valuable, um, no doubt you'll be seeing this slide a lot this week, but if you do find it valuable, then please uh, consider donating and helping uh, these charities if you can. Okay, so we're going to cover two main topics today. Um, not any surprise really, because it's monitoring and tuning. Um, this is a technical presentation, so it assumes you have ZOS Connect uh, running and deployed in production. Probably you've got a workload, API workload going through those servers. Um, and the main aim of this uh, presentation is to talk you through kind of effective monitoring of that environment. Um, and then that's going to allow you to know how well your servers are performing, um, give you a baseline for what's normal given the current workload that you're processing today. Uh, and then we're going to look at the tuning side. So that's kind of really needed to have the baseline of where you are to understand when you make a change to the environment, um, you can compare the before and after results uh, to see if there has been an improvement. And we're going to cover quite a lot of information today. Uh, so this presentation does include a lot of links that take you off uh, to find out more details about a given topic. Uh, but as Nick said, um, fire questions into the chat. Um, I'm hoping to get this done in about 45 minutes-ish uh, so that we leave enough time at the end for hopefully a bit of discussion and questions as well. So with that, let's get going. So as I mentioned, we're going to Imagine this world where we have uh, ZOS Connect deployed into production and we're running a meaningful workload through that. Um, and as I mentioned, it's important to get that visibility on the health of your ZOS Connect infrastructure. So we uh, will be able to uh, look at the what's going on within that orange box to detect problems and uh, understand from a monitoring point of view uh, what is normal. Um, the workload is going to be in the form of either API provider requests, which is where we're exposing an existing uh, KICS or IMS or DB2 asset out to the outside world as an API. 
um, or potentially API requester. So we're coming from a COBOL or peer one application calling out to an API off the host uh, or both, potentially both in the same server. And um, you can imagine um, we've got a single orange box here, which is providing that uh, function. Uh, but most customers, when they're deployed into production, will have perhaps two of those uh, servers running per LPAR and potentially multiple LPARs as well. And they're distributing the work across that environment. Uh, so what we're aiming to do really is to, to monitor that orange box uh, to understand what's going on inside of it, which sounds kind of simple. It's you know, just one thing um, that we can monitor, uh, but actually what we need to do is open it up a bit and take a look at what's going on inside that orange box uh, to then understand what it is that we actually need to, um, to monitor for that environment. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and we're gonna look at the layers of ZOS Connect. So within that orange box, what's really going on and what do we have to consider uh, when we're thinking about the monitoring and tuning. So it is built on a software stack. Uh, we have the ZOS Connect product itself. That's a, a web application. So it's receiving those API requests over HTTP. Uh, and so ZOS Connect itself is running within a Liberty server. The Liberty application server and ZOS Connect are both written in the Java language. So they're both running inside a JVM. The JVM in turn, and we're kind of delving down into the layers here, is written in C. So that's running inside the language environment on the mainframe. And then finally, we have ZOS itself. So the operating system uh, running on the Z hardware. So we have multiple stacks here uh, that the product is built on top of that all have their own kind of con considerations for monitoring um, to ensure the health of the overall infrastructure is, is good. Um, and to enable us to performance tune. Um, you notice there's no little icon on the LE bit. That's not because there isn't one, but more because uh, the language environment we find customers uh, don't have to change uh, or tune beyond the defaults that are set and the ones we have in our started task JCL, which is setting on the heat pools and heat pool 64. Uh, we haven't yet had to uh, tell customers and direct them to make changes to language environments. So that's not something we're going to be covering today. But the other four, uh, ZOS Connect, Liberty, Java, and ZOS are very important. And those are the things that we're going to delve into in a bit more detail. And so what are we going to look at? Well, for each of those four areas, we're going to take a look at these things. So both ZOS Connect and Liberty are products in their own right, which means they have messages. They will issue messages uh, to various logs and we can, we're gonna talk a bit more about where they go, uh, but they help us to understand how healthy the system is, what it's up to, if there is any immediate problems that we need to take care of. Um, once we know the server's up and running and happy, then we can uh, process the requests. So we'll look at how we monitor those requests going through the system. Then we'll delve into the JVM. So having a healthy JVM is important in terms of its usage of its heap and also its garbage collection activity. And then finally, we'll take a look at from the ZOS side, not so much the operating system tuning, uh, but more the CPU availability and also uh, the memory side. And then that kind of ties back into that final point under Liberty, which is executor threads. So the threading model that's used in Liberty and how that can be affected uh, by CPU and the memory side as well. So we'll tie all those things together. Uh, what I've done throughout the presentation is I've used these icons and put them in the top right-hand corner of the slides. So at any point in the presentation, when we're talking about something, you'll be able to refer back to those icons and know what it is uh, that I'm referring to one of these four particular areas. So we're gonna start off with the product messages because as I mentioned, um, ZOS Connect and Liberty were both output messages. Uh, it's information that we get for free. It's gonna to go to the logs. Um, so as long as we know where to look and, and what to look for, uh, then we can make sure that we've got a server that's up and running and healthy and ready to process requests. So the server itself from ZOS Connect point of view uh, is going to output messages in two different ways. 
So we've got messages that go to the ZOS side of um, the product, but then also messages and trace and logs that go to the USS, the Unix system services side. And on the ZOS side, we have uh, both the job logs, so the standard out and standard error messages that go to our job logs. And we also have console messages, so things that are going out as WTOs um, to the console. On the USS side, we've got uh, messages log, so very similar to the standard out and standard error, but written into the ZFS, it's a rolling log. And then also the trace log. So if you have a trace enabled, perhaps um, level three's asked you to capture some more diagnostics, then the trace log will go to the ZFS side. Uh, and finally, any FFDC, so the first failure data captures. If anything goes badly wrong, then these will also get written to the ZFS side. And the key thing with um, product messages is we're kind of really looking at the ZOS side. So how can we use the existing system automation to pick up on messages that uh, are being put out on the ZOS side? Um, and what we'll do is, uh, is very briefly just kind of review some of those messages that are the most important to look for and then how you can spot them. Oh, uh, one top tip <clears throat> on this slide before we go on is that in the um, standard out and standard error, now, it's possible to include timestamps. Uh, that wasn't always the case, and it was very frustrating, probably from people operating the product, but also from our side in the level three service, that we'd get logs in and we couldn't match up the timestamps. But now uh, there's a link there that shows you how you can set the console format um, and the versions of ZOS Connect that that's supported in, so you can get uh, more timestamp information in your, in your job logs. So the messages themselves, the ZOS Connect uh, messages that come out, um, these are some of the kind of key ones that we need to think about when uh, looking at the monitoring of the product. So when the server starts up, we've got messages around uh, the location of the artifacts that are deployed. So the API services and API requests are archives. So we need to make sure that they're available and have been loaded uh, when the server starts. If, if there's a problem, then we'll get these messages out. And then when the server's up and running, um, whether it's sending API requests to IMS, Kix, or DB2, then these are the following messages that, again, we need to look for to make sure that um, the server's got its connections, uh, it's <clears throat> got enough free connections, there's been no uh, problem processing the requests as they flow through the server. And that's on the ZOS Connect side. And then on the Liberty side, as I mentioned, uh, ZOS Connect is running in Liberty as a web application. So we need to make sure that the web servers, uh, it's started, it's running, um, TCP channels are started, the server's not paused, um, there's no issues with the certificates that are being used for um, any of the authentication, uh, the threads are behaving well, and as I mentioned before, there's kind of no FFDCs and the server is, um, is happy. So the best way to monitor uh, both the Liberty and ZOS Connect messages is using kind of existing system automation to trap um, the messages that go out to the console. And we can watch those and then take action if we need to. That's done by uh, setting this piece of XML into your um, server configuration. So using the ZOS logging uh, configuration element, you can enable it to log to MVS, so issue the WTOs, and then you can give it a list of messages that you would like to um, issue as WTOs for you to monitor. And there's a link there uh, to our doc that gives you a bit more information about uh, how to do that. And you can copy and paste this particular chunk of text if, if you want to, uh, rather than trying to get it out of uh, the PDF. Um, but all of that allows us to make sure that we've got a server that started, uh, it's healthy, it's happy, and uh, it's ready to process the API requests themselves. And so that's what we're gonna go on to and look at next in terms of the monitoring um, is our API requests. And to do that, we are going to take a look at the, again, within the orange box, what's going on within the orange box. And the ZOS Connect product can monitor the requests that flow through um, ZOS Connect using its interceptor framework. That captures a lot of information about uh, both the API provider and API requester requests as they flow through the server. And it uses that interceptor framework then to make the information available to be sent to lots of different um, locations. Uh, the first one is the audit interceptor. So the audit interceptor is packaged as part of the ZOS Connect product. 
And this allows uh, you to write the information about the request into SMF 123 records, which can then be processed by products like IBM Z Decision Support or MXG, or where you can use CDP to stream them off the platform um, to be processed in operational analytics or Splunk or that kind of thing. So by persisting that information into the SMF records, there's kind of endless opportunities in, in how that can be analyzed. Uh, there's also real-time monitors. Um, so the difference here is that with SMF, you have to wait for the request to finish and then it gets persisted to SMF. Um, with the real-time monitors and the vendor interceptors that enable those, uh, they're watching the requests in real time. So they're, um, as it flows through, they're pushing information out um, to wherever they store it. And that is then available for you to look at in your panels and watch the request real time as it flows through the system. So an example here is the Omega Mon for JVM tool. Um, CA SysView also has a real-time monitor. Um, and then also kind of related is this end-to-end -end transaction tracking. Uh, so it's possible to use a product like ZAPM Connect and their interceptor to track a request as it flows through multiple systems on the platform. Um, we're not going to cover the end-to-end -end tracking today so much uh, because what we're focused on is really the monitoring and performance of the uh, kind of server itself within that orange box. So we're going to look at the audit interceptor and also the real-time monitoring. Uh, and we'll start by looking at the real-time monitoring and then go on to look at uh, the SMF records. So in terms of the real-time monitoring, um, I'm going to use the Omega Mon for JVM uh, tool as an example of, of what this can do. Uh, with respect to real-time monitoring. And really the power here is the ability to drill into what APIs and services uh, you've got deployed. So this is the API provider side um, of the product. And you can use a real-time monitoring tool to look at the invocation counts, that any errors that have occurred, um, the response times of the request as it flows through the server for a given API. You can also then, and you can see the little white tabs along the um, top in this example, you can drill into the services or you can look at the systems of record. And again, you can break the data down and look at for a given system of record, uh, how many API requests have gone to that system of record, were there any errors, any timeouts, again, the response times that have happened um, during that processing. Uh, you can drill in even further and look at the resource, so the transaction name and the program name that was invoked um, for that given API. And the real power of, of using this real-time monitoring is that you can look at what's going on in flight. So real-time, what's happening right now on the server. You can watch that live data, or you can go back a little bit over the last five minutes, or even a longer time period. So it gives you a lot of flexibility on how you can um, look at your API provider requests. And you can do the same actually for API requester as well. So here we have an example of uh, API requester. Um, again, the method that was called, the number of calls and the response time uh, of each of those calls as, as the request flowed through the system. You can drill down further again and look at individual requests. And then for each individual request, you can then get a whole panel that displays every single bit of information about that request. So lots of rich information that's available to us uh, when using this real-time monitoring. Uh, yeah, and just a kind of link there, which um, gives you a bit more information because uh, the API requester functionality for Omega Wolf JVM is, is quite new. So um, that link there takes you to the PTFs and the, and the blogging post that explains a bit more about it. And the, the real kind of benefit of having this ability to real-time monitor the requests is the capability of alerting because you will know immediately um, if there is a problem with that request. Uh, you don't have to wait until the request completes and the SMF record is written and then it's pushed out. Uh, you get the capability right there to see when there's a particular error with the um, request or, or the request is timed out. Um, and you can drill down into the details kind of real time immediately and find out what went wrong. So here we've gone into uh, the details of the requests that have flown through the system. We can see this one at the top has um, timed out. It's taken longer than 30 seconds to process. So we can go in and drill into the details of that. Um, or if there were non-success return codes coming back and we weren't expecting that to happen, again, you can flag that up and issue warnings on, onto your dashboard um, to monitor that. 
So it's a very powerful way to allow you to act immediately and monitoring that um, the requests as they flow through the system. Uh, but the, I guess the only issue is that it does require you to buy a third party product. So you have to have a Megamon configured or installed, or you have to have CA SysView uh, installed. So what that means is, um, you know, you've got to take action and buy something, but there is a way to get the same data using SMF. And uh, that can be done using the ZOS Connect SMF123 records. The 123 records are um, now at version two, and we write the subtype one record for API provider and the subtype two record for API requester. So we've got two different types of subtype of record, um, both with kind of a similar structure in the there's the headers, sections, and then for each request, um, we collect all the information about that request. And when we have enough, we write out a single SMF record. So we've got 32 kilobytes of data pushed out into a record that has multiple requests in. It makes for a much more efficient use of the record space. The, uh, the complete formats are there in the link that I've uh, included, so you can go and, um, go and look at that. Uh, but it's important to say that the real-time monitoring and the SMF monitoring uh, both have the same data available to them. So it's not like you're getting any more data with the real-time monitoring. Um, it's exactly the same data, uh, but it's just being uh, stored and processed in a different way. So what is that data that you get? Well, you can find out uh, where the server's running, um, what LPAR and the server name uh, that was processing the request. You can find out uh, the API information, um, who is invoking that API and whether that username was mapped and um, then where it was going to. So what system of record or if it's an API requester, what API endpoint, um, was it successful? <clears throat> so did you get a success code back or um, was there an error code during that processing of the API request? Uh, the API responses, um, payload sizes, so uh, request and response payload sizes. And finally, the timestamps. So everything kind of in the top part of this slide is, is for most requests is gonna be pretty similar uh, as the requests are processed. But the timestamps are the thing that can vary, especially when uh, we're monitoring and, and there might be an issue going on and we need to investigate. It's really the timestamps that can allow us to uh, figure out if there's a problem processing that request, whether there's a perhaps a CPU delay or a wait time delay, and we can pinpoint exactly where that's happening. So what I'm going to do next is kind of drill into the timestamps and just show you a bit more about where we take them uh, and what it means when uh, you're looking at those timestamps. And we'll do that first for uh, API provider. So we're looking um, at the orange box again. So within the ZOS Connect server, uh, there's some things that happen up front before ZOS Connect <clears throat> starts processing the request. So Liberty does some work uh, from the kind of security side uh, for the connection. So it's got some TLS processing, some authentication work that it will do that we don't kind of capture within our timestamps at the moment. Um, but when Liberty's done that work, what we do is we take our first timestamp T1 and that's when the request comes into ZOS Connect to be processed. Uh, then we um, kind of run the interceptors. So the order interceptors, uh, the one that's doing the SMF record data collection authorization interceptor. So if you've um, got require auth and you need to do authorization checking. Um, and then we go and run uh, the API that's being invoked and also the service. So then the data transformation is happening, uh, turning that JSON payload into the working storage uh, layout that we're going to send on to that system of record. Then the system of record is about to be called and we take T2 uh, just before we go off and call that system of record. Uh, the request goes off. It uh, gets processed and then comes back to ZOS Connect. And that's when we take T3. So that allows us to know like, how long did it take the system of record to process that request and get back to us. Again, then we've uh, got to turn that working storage layout back into the JSON payload uh, for sending back to the calling application. And so we take T4 uh, just as we're about to send that back. Um, so after we've done the data transformation um, and come back out of the API, we take the full timestamp and then we go back to the caller. And so by analyzing these timestamps, it's possible to isolate the bit of the processing uh, where a request was taking too long, because you can look at the differences between the timestamps to find out what's going on. Um, Omega Mon shows the timestamps in real time, um, but there's tools like 
the IBM Operation Analytics or MXG or other processing tools that do this based on the SMF data. Um, another tool that does this on the SMF data uh, is Kix PA, and that just recently um, shipped some support to do this. So I thought it'd be a good way to um, show how this can be useful. So Kix PA uh, now it supports the SMF 123 records. And you can see here in the red box that uh, it's it formatted out the timestamp. So it's shown you um, the absolute time of when the request hit each of those bits of the processing. Um, but it's also worked out the uh, deltas between those times. So you can see the overall response time, uh, the time it sent, uh, spent just before it went off to the system of record, how long it took in, um, in kicks in this case, and then uh, how long it took to get the request back out again. Um, the other nice thing about Kix PA uh, is that it does correlation with the Kix 110 records um, so that you can see the full end-to-end -end flow of the request as it went uh, through ZOS Connect, but then also off to Kix and back again. So here we've got um, the TS55 region uh, is our kind of TOR, and that's receiving the request, and then it's DPLing off to ZC13 to run the logic and then come back again. And, and by um, correlating all those records together, KixPA gives you a nice flow view of, of what happened. Um, it also does a nice summary view. So as well as for each individual request, looking at the timestamps, it allows you to get a summary of uh, the averages and maximums of each of those uh, hops within the server. So it can really allow you to understand how the server is uh, performing when processing those requests uh, and also which request uh, took the maximum. So you can go and drill in and find out uh, what went wrong with that particular request. And for the timestamps as well, um, as I mentioned, we, we take them for API requester and provider. So both sides of, um, of the processing that goes on within ZOS Connect. Uh, this time we're starting off from a ZOS application, a COBOL or PL1, and we're going off to an API that's off the platform. Um, we take a timestamp before we leave the uh, application. Um, so the application calls our stub and we take a timestamp and then we go off to ZOS Connect. So now we can uh, get a bit more detail about what's going on with uh, Liberty's processing of the TLS and the authentication. Again, we take a timestamp when Liberty gives us that request. So as it flows into the product, uh, we again run all the interceptors and we come into the API requester. And then the API requesters uh, quite likely it will need to obtain a token to go off and call the endpoint. So the API requester flow has a set of timestamps just before we go and get the token from the security server. And also when we come back from the security server, because you can imagine, if you're a, you're, you own this infrastructure and your application team come to you and say, uh, oh, our application is taking ages to call this API, what's going on? Uh, one of the things that it may be taking time doing is going off the host to this common security server to obtain a token and come back again. And if that's the case, then you can see quite clearly the timestamps between T3 and T4 um, are elongated, and then that helps you to know that's where the problem is. Um, ZOS Connect does cache those uh, tokens, so the timestamp between T3 and T4 may be um, you know, tiny, absolutely almost indistinguishable, but it, when it's not cached and it has to go and fetch it, it could be a long amount of time. And the same for the API endpoint. Again, the API endpoint is quite likely to be off the host, um, so understanding the T5 and T6, like the timestamps before and after we call that endpoint, will help you to narrow down where the time is being spent. Uh, finally, again, we uh, come back and we flow the request back to the ZOS application as we're leaving. Um, so this really helps you to understand uh, from a timestamp perspective how that request is uh, being processed and you can monitor that. The final thing I wanted to say about uh, SMF records is streaming them off the platform. Um, SMF records can be extracted and tools like the CDP can parse them and send them off to uh, platforms like Splunk for analysis. So you can use like a common set of tooling um, and dashboards to analyze the SMF records over time, uh, break them apart per server, per LPAR. Uh, so it's just another way in which that data that's stored within the SMF 123 records um, can be used and done in a common way that allows you to give those uh, dashboards to the application teams uh, that might um, care about what's going on there. 
Okay, I'm just going to pause because I haven't seen any questions come up uh, and I don't think we've got any yet. So just take no. a breath and a drink and make sure everyone's okay with that. Okay, Mark, I've, I've been keeping an eye on it, as, as I'm sure Alan has as well, and nothing has come up uh, yet. So okay, awesome. Proceed. Perfect, thank you. Okay, that's good. It's a natural point to break because what we're going to do now is switch away from the API request monitoring. Um, we're going to delve into the JVM um, in which the ZOS Connect product and Liberty are running. And specifically, we're going to look at the heap and the garbage collection in that JVM. So both uh, ZOS Connect and Liberty are written in Java. Um, Java is an object oriented language, which means that you don't have to concern yourself with obtaining and freeing memory uh, like you do in older programming languages like C or high level assembler. Um, you instead create new objects. Uh, you instantiate an object and Java keeps track of the memory it needs to store that object. And it does that on its heap. Um, then when you're done with the object, you can uh, throw it away, throw the reference away. And then what Java will do is uh, tidy that up for you with its garbage collection when the object's no longer needed. So to ensure we've got a healthy JVM that's uh, processing our requests and running ZOS Connect and Liberty well, we need to monitor those two things, the heap and the garbage collection. We need to first see how much heap is being used and consumed. Um, and then we need to also see how long the JVM is spending doing its garbage collection. But the key uh, to this is to make sure we monitor those things at the right time. Because if we start the server up and we start monitoring, what we're going to actually monitor is the kind of initialization and the JVM warming up and the JIT compiling happening of the classes. And that's not going to give us a very meaningful view of, of how the JVM is performing when it's warmed up and it's optimized and it's processing that peak workload. So after the server is processed, a good few hundred thousand requests is the right time for us to be uh, looking at this information and figuring out whether our JVM is performing well. Um, and you might do this kind of during a performance test where you have control over the load and the duration of that work. Um, or you may know when your peak workload happens um, if you're looking at this in production. And that's kind of the key point where you should be, um, be taking this information. So one way you can do this um, is by using the Java Health Center, so IBM's Health Center tool. Um, and this is really nice because it gives you a, a visualization of, of what's going on. So you can see here in the purple chart that the heap usage is kind of growing naturally over time as more and more objects are getting created. And then there's a pause when Java um, spots the heap usage has grown, and then it does some garbage collection and the heap usage drops down. So we get this really nice sawtooth curve, and that's a kind of healthy looking curve. We can see then as well in that red um, circle that the percentage of time the JVM spent doing this was about 1.8% of the overall time it spent garbage collecting, which mean, means that it spent 98.2-ish percent um, doing meaningful work, business work. So both of those values are going to add up to 100%. And that's kind of the key thing, and I'll come on in a couple of slides to explain exactly why um, that's important. Uh, the Java Health Center tool we're looking at here is uh, a great tool to use if you're doing kind of testing or performance testing, um, but you wouldn't necessarily run it in a production environment because it requires a direct IP connection from your desktop machine that's running the tool to the ZOSL pirates monitoring. Um, so to make sure you can keep an eye on the JVMs running in production, you would use a tool like the Omega Mon for JVM. Uh, BMC have a tool, CA have a tool. There's a couple of them out there. Uh, but what that's doing is it's running uh, on the LPAR with the JVM and it's doing the same monitoring. So you can see the same bits of information here, uh, but it's doing it uh, on the platform with the JVM. Here you can see uh, it's achieving a time in GC uh, was 0.4%, so it's uh, performing very well. And the time unpaused was 99.5%. So this JVM is performing particularly well. So what are we aiming to achieve uh, with the JVM? Well, here is uh, the guidance that, that we've uh, kind of brought together and are giving. And that's the, the time spent in GC pauses. If you're seeing it less than 2%, it's, uh, it's good. You're in a good place. Uh, we've seen some customers, uh, like in that last chart, 
where their time in the GC pauses has been less than half a percent. And that's excellent. I mean, that's probably as good as you can get it in terms of uh, processing the work. If you're running a greater than 3% spent in doing that garbage collection, then that suggests that you're going to potentially require some heat tuning, um, which brings us on to the next point, which is about the heat guidance. So within the JVM, heap occupancy should remain between about 40 and 70% of the overall maximum heap size. If it goes above 70%, uh, your JVM is going to be working hard to garbage collect, which means you're going to spend more time in garbage collection. If it's less than 40%, it means that um, you're going to collect many, many more objects, uh, which then would result in a long garbage collection cycle uh, rather than the JVM doing it kind of frequently, um, but not too frequently. You use the JVM uh, minus XMX command line argument to configure that maximum heap size. Um, and then you use your monitoring to keep an eye on it and make sure you have the right size configured for your workload. And just one point about the garbage collection, if you don't have a tool in production that you can use to monitor the JVM, then it is possible to use the verbose GC um, out command line option for the JVM, which produces a log that you can then uh, load into the support system, the IBM support assistant tool. Uh, and that gives you the same information to show you how well the uh, JVM is performing. Um, some customers do run this in production. The overhead's pretty low, so uh, it's just another option there for monitoring the JVM. Okay, so we've looked at the server itself is up and running. We've looked at processing API requests. Uh, we've looked at the JVM, and now we're going to go down into that kind of fourth level, uh, which is um, the CPU and memory as or availability on the LPAR on which the server is running. And the things we're going to look at are from the CPU side, um, we're going to look at the availability of general processors and the zips, both in terms of how much is being consumed, but then also um, how much is free and available on the LPAR. Uh, and similarly, we're going to look at the memory side. So how much of the 64-bit storage is the ZOS Connect, the address space in which ZOS Connect is running, how much is it consuming? We're not going to worry too much about 31-bit storage consumption. Um, both Java and ZOS have moved a lot of their key storage above the bar, meaning that 31-bit storage for a Liberty Java application nowadays isn't so much of a concern. We haven't seen um, many problems there. Uh, again, um, both of these things can be monitored in real time. So if you have tooling that allows you to do it, you can monitor it in real time. Uh, but if you don't, then what we uh, have available on the platform is the ability to monitor both CPU and memory consumption using SMF records. So the SMF records that allow us to get this information for us to be able to keep a track of what's going on with the CPU and memory are from the CPU side, we have the SMF 70 and 72 records. The RMF is writing these out. So the 70 records is um, giving us CPU usage across the KEC and the LPAR. Uh, it's giving us the zip offload percentage and lots of other useful information. The 72 records are telling us all about the WLM behavior and how much each service class is uh, consuming in terms of um, zip and general processor. We also have the SMF 30 records, so that's the common address space work. Um, I'm not going to focus on those because they give us the information for the address space, but actually what we need to do in terms of monitoring ZOS Connect is, is get a much more finer grain level of what's consuming the CPU within the address space. So we're gonna focus on the 70 and 72 records. Um, the way that we can actually get useful information from the 70 and 72 records is by performing a WLM classification of our workload on the ZOS Connect server. So we do this in two ways. So the first way, is the whole address space. So within the STC subsystem type, you can classify the whole address space um, that ZOS Connect is running within. Again, it gives us the whole kind of address spaces, CPU consumption, uh, zip offload, which is useful, but what it lacks is the ability to understand for a given API or set of requests that are flowing through the server, um, how does that CPU break down? Um, the way we get that information is by classifying our APIs under the CB subsystem type. So we can uh, have 
a classification of a single API, multiple APIs, all of the APIs, and assign them service and report classes so that we can really drill down into how much consumption uh, each of the APIs is consuming on the platform. Uh, this is really useful because not only does it give us the CPU information, but it tells us about the response times for the requests. It tells us about the uh, number of requests that were processed. And it also allows us to separate out the CPU consumption for processing the requests versus the CPU consumed for doing all the general work like uh, the TLS um, or garbage collection, because all of that will be classified under the STC subsystem type. Uh, WLM will never double account the CPU that's consumed. So what's left after processing the APIs and accounted for there is then accounted for in the STC subsystem type. So it really gives us a nice way to break apart um, where that CPU time is being spent. And the way you do that um, to classify your APIs is by using the ZOS WLM feature. So you can um, add that to your server XML, and then you can use this configuration to uh, say, for a particular API path or a set of API paths, or even use a wildcard to say all of the APIs that this server processes, uh, please classify it under this transaction class. Uh, top tip is to be super careful when you're uh, using the wildcarding. Uh, we've had uh, quite a few cases from customers who haven't quite got that wildcarding right and it wasn't classifying properly. Um, so the link there tells you um, lots more information about uh, how to do that configuration. But the key thing is, like, even if you don't uh, break apart your APIs, um, at least put the wildcarded, you know, capture everything so that you can distinguish between what the CPU consumption of the, the APIs is versus the server's common work. And you can look at that CPU consumption um, via RMF reports. So here's an example of an RMF report that is um, for the TMZIC report class. It gives us on the left hand side, you can see the transactions uh, that were completed within this time period. Um, and then it breaks it down per second. So you can get an idea of the number of requests that the server was managing to process per second. It gives you the response time as well. Um, and here we were achieving a five millisecond response time. Um, at the bottom of that transaction time column, you can see there's a standard deviation. So this was a, a contrived example. Um, but within a real production workload, you could then see what the standard deviation looks like uh, either side of that, um, that response time. We've also got the CPU consumed. So here we've got 19.7 um, seconds of CPU time, of which 19.65 was spent on the zips. And this is really important to monitor because you want as much of the ZOS Connect workload to run on the zips as possible. Um, ZOS Connect is 95 plus percent offloadable because it's written in Java. And running on the zips means, well, for one, you'll pay less because it's not uh, not accounted for in the same way as general processor time, but also uh, zips run at full clock speed. So if you're spending time running on the zips, you're getting more work done on that processor. So making sure you keep an eye on that offload percentage is key. Uh, the IIP CP value is the one to look for. So if that, shows you where you could have spent time running on the zip, but you didn't, you're on the general processor. So keeping an eye on that report and making sure that you offload properly um, is an important thing to do. So in terms of CPU tuning, the things we want to look at are what's consuming the CPU and how can we improve that? And we can take actions to reduce CPU consumption by doing things like enabling persistent connections. So that's enabled by default, but you might want to check that it's actually um, yeah, enabled in your configuration. There's a link there to, to show you more information about it. Um, also reusing TLS sessions. Again, avoiding repeated and expensive crypto work. So lots of links there about how to, to make sure that's enabled. Um, keeping up to date with the product version. So just, uh, just recently, we released 3049 of the product. That has uh, the latest version of Liberty 21009. And that's got improvements around caching um, incoming JWTs, around um, not needing to revalidate them for every request. So by keeping up to date and getting that improved um, support, then you're potentially getting those performance improvements as well. Uh, hardware assist. So 
if you do need to do the crypto work, then making sure that you're offloading that to CPACF or instructions or um, crypto cards if you have them, there's a link there that tells you how to do that. And finally, on the CPU consumption, the payload size and complexity. Um, if you have more data to transform, ZOS Connect's job is to take that from JSON, transform it to working storage and back again. The more efficient the payload sizes are, the, the better ZOS Connect can do that and the less CPU it's going to take to, to achieve that. In terms of CPU availability, um, so we talked about the SMF70 records. Uh, that allows you to look at the CPU capacity on the LPAR. So using RMF to generate those CPU activity reports is important so that we can make sure we um, have enough available CPU on the system to process the requests. Um, we've seen customers who notice delays in the processing and they see elongated time spent in ZOS Connect because um, there wasn't enough CPU available to process the requests. Uh, another reason we've seen that as well is, is the important levels of the WLM service class that ZOS Connect is sat in. Um, that wasn't configured properly. ZOS Connect wasn't being given enough time on the processes by WLM, and it wasn't able to, to process the requests um, as well as it could have done. A key thing to point out here is uh, to make sure that your WLM service class is, is not higher than the system of record that you're flowing those API provider requests to. Uh, we want to make sure that that um, system of record is not flooded with incoming requests if, if ZOS Connect has a higher importance than it. So it should be at the same or less than the system of record. Again, further information, uh, the link below um, about uh, performance. Okay, so that brings us on to the final topic of um, ZOS uh, itself, and that's the memory side. Um, the thing we're going to talk about is MemLimit. Uh, on the right here, we've got a picture of a ZOS address space, and it's 64-bit storage at the top there. There's a theoretical 16 exabyte limit on 64-bit um, storage, and that's 16 billion gigabytes. So you wouldn't want a single address space to for a coding error or just through the product it's running to start chewing its way through um, lots and lots of 64-bit storage. You'd quickly run out of um, actual storage, and then you would also um, run out of auxiliary storage, and then LPAR would start paging, and everything is goes bad from that point onwards. And that's why ZOS has a mem limit. This is a, a soft limit um, on the 64-bit storage that a particular address space can um, access. So it's not pre-allocated, it's just a line which the address space cannot pass beyond. And the 64-bit storage, as I mentioned previously, is important because um, Java has got a, its heap up there, it's got a lot of caches up there. And also on the ZOS side, we've got our native thread stack storage up there. Um, the LE environment and the JVM uh, combined have a requirement of three megabyte for each thread that's created to process workload. And because of that, that's why we need to kind of concern ourselves with how much of this 64-bit uh, storage are we consuming um, before we get to the mem limit. The way we can keep an eye on that is, again, in real time. So there are tools like the Megamon for JVM that will monitor the amount of 64-bit storage used and alert us when there's a problem. Um, other tools do this as well. And we also have a nice command in the OMVS display that for a particular process ID, um, you can look at the amount of mem limit that's being consumed currently, uh, also the high water, so how far did it get up, um, and also the limit that's set for that particular address space. And the reason you want to do this is because uh, reaching the maximum of your mem limit is bad. Um, it will result in Java out of memory exceptions. You will have a ZOS Connect server that will stop processing requests. So we need to make sure that we do not um, exceed the mem limit. The way we do this is by setting a configuration property in our server XML called executor max threads. So, in terms of what's in that mem limit, we know the maximum Java heap size because we've configured that when the JVM started. But the thing that is dynamic and can change at runtime is the number of threads that are in use. And as I mentioned, each thread takes three megabytes of storage. And by default, Liberty does not limit the number of threads that it can create. So we've had customer situations in the past where 
there's been a slowdown in the system of record or a slowdown on the system, requests have started queuing up inside the server, which means that as new requests come in, more and more threads are being created and they've reached their mem limit and things have gone bad. But what we can do is set the max threads um, within our server XML to say to Liberty, you cannot go beyond this point. And then that allows us to calculate a mem limit that we need to set for our particular address space for ZOS Connect. So you absolutely must take this into account when you're uh, running the server in production. You do not want to go um, up to the mem limit or beyond. Hey, Mark. Okay. Mark. Hello. Hi, Nick. Um, we have had a question. Uh, oh, great. Alan has uh, addressed it in some ways. It's not related to mem limit. It's okay. in the previous section uh, where you were talking about zip offload. Yeah. Um, and it's from Sean Catlow. We saw improved zip use by defining them as multi-threaded. Is yeah. this a generally good thing to do for ZOS Connect? Yeah, so I think Alan's right. That's probably the SMT2 uh, support for the zips. Um, yeah, that, uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, has shown improvements um, because what that enables a single uh, zip to do is to process um, multiple threads in parallel. So you've effectively got the process of doing um, twice as much work. It doesn't kind of work out like that, but theoretically that's what it's doing. It's processing two instruction pipelines in parallel. Um, and that means you potentially theoretically have more zip uh, capacity. And then in terms of uh, ZOS Connect, because we offload so much to the zip that can really show good improvements. So I think it's one of those things where, um, yeah, uh, enable it and try it and see. Um, and in most cases it does, uh, does improve performance. So yeah, good question, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, in true HBO style, I'll say brief recap, mem limits, not a good thing, fix it. Thank <laughs> you, Mark. Excellent, thank you, Nick. Okay, um, yeah, so in terms of the mem limit, uh, final thing to say on this is uh, to keep an eye on those threads uh, that are being used within the address space. Um, again, common monitoring products will allow you to do this for the JVM. You can get it through a display command as well. Um, that allows you to see where you're getting up to in terms of a high water usage of, of threads and allows you to take action to set that max threads uh, when your usage is becoming um, too high. The other thing to consider is um, your connections to your system of record. So for the number of threads that you're allowing to come into the server, make sure that you have um, the connection pools and session pools large enough to support that going off to your uh, Kicks IMS and DB2 uh, backends. Okay, and what that does is kind of brings us uh, to the end of the presentation. Um, I think I've left just enough time for a few questions at the end, but I really wanna finish by saying the monitoring process of the messages to make sure the server's up and running and happy the requests themselves to make sure they're flowing through the system and the application teams are happy because everything's processing well. The JVM to make sure it's configured well and tuned and the LPAR in terms of the CPU and memory availability. By keeping an eye on those, those four kind of key things, that's gonna put you in a really good position to understand where your infrastructure's at, where the normal is, what the baseline is. And then if you do identify a problem, you can make a single change um, and then monitor that to see what the effect of the change is. One thing uh, I did mention at the beginning is that Alan's input has been amazing for this particular presentation. And what we have done is uh, produced an update to our documentation that contains this information that you've seen in the presentation slides, um, but also more as well. Um, and that's gonna be available at the end of this month. Uh, so when we deliver our next version of ZOS Connect, this is gonna go into the knowledge, uh, not knowledge center, sorry, the documentation, um, uh, as a set of topics that you can kind of read through and get more guidance. So for further information, that's going to be a great place uh, to go. And um, with that, I'm going to finish there and, and say, is there any um, further questions that uh, we'd like to kind of raise? You've got, yeah, five or six minutes to cover them. Thanks, Mark. Um, yes, uh, you, 
indeed did finish inside the hour. We've got five minutes. If anyone would like to raise their hand, we'll invite you to unmute yourself and ask a question if you have a question for Mark or in, in fact any of the ZOS Connect team. Um, yeah, bef um, before that, I'll, I'll just say um, as well that I really appreciate any feedback you might have about the presentation. It's my first time presenting here at GSE, so um, yeah, very, very welcome to receive any feedback uh, if you have it as well. Thanks. So do we want him back, I think is the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good point. Um, please uh, provide feedback for this session. It's session 4AN. Um, we have had another question from Sean Kaplow. Are there any extra details we can get from API Connect for monitoring? That's a really good question. Um, um, I see Tony's on. I don't know if uh, Tony might have a bit more information about that. I mean, it may fall into that kind of transaction tracking side of things, like the bigger picture of where the request is flowing from and to. Um, um, yeah, ab absolutely. So um, I guess this follows on somewhat from the, the, the session this morning. So um, th there's a couple of things. So the, the ZAPM Connect stuff that you've talked about going out to uh, App Dynamics or Instana, the, these, these tools that monitor sort of the end-to-end -end request flow, um, certainly you can capture the uh, data from API Connect and sort of get that, that correlation across. So, um, so, so you can sort of see that in, in context in those in those tools um also you know piping uh, information out through um uh, prometheus uh, to Gr grafana or, or splunk um and again you know from zellers connect piping out from cdp as you described mark out to splunk so you can sort of use that as a place where you you bring that information together um but yes uh, in terms of details i <sighs> I don't know where I would go specifically right now to sort of say, here's the list of like all the good stuff, but maybe we can take that as an action mark. I'm sure mm. there's um, a, a document or an article somewhere that that team have written um, and we can uh, post that to a community or Nick, I don't know if there's a way we can sort of reach out sort of post-conference um, to, to, to share that. Yeah, uh, Mark, did you put your contact details on your first slide? I did, yep, yep, yep. it's on the first slide. So, uh, Sean, you might want to um, make contact with Mark and he can feed back things as they get to uh, get issued. Another good, great way is you've got the community, haven't you, um, mm. Tony, that details, uh, new collateral, all things like that get to uh, get published on the community. So if you're not already a member of that community, that would also be uh, a good a good strategic move for you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get a, a more detailed answer for you of the, mm. the kind of stuff you can get out of it. it. Should be fairly straightforward. So with two minutes left, that looks like the last question. You did get a pat on the back. Great session, Mark, from Colin Knight. So yeah, well thanks, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if last last calling, the, the, the gavel is coming down. If, that, if there's no more questions, I'll draw a close to this session. So thank you all for attending. Please fill out the feedback form. And we'll see you in half an hour's time for the latest on Java with uh, Phil Wakelin um, talking about his experiences, customer scenarios, and where uh, Java on, on the mainframe is going, with a special guest appearance from Rob Stroud, who will explain a little bit about what has been going on with their Java deployments uh, at his organization. So see you back here in about half an hour. Thank you for joining. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.